everybody. Welcome to another brand new episode of the Geek <laughs> Buddies. <gasps> hey! hey! Well, we're back again this week to talk about all kinds of stuff going on in the world of geekdom. Uh, and we're going to have a lot of fun talking about some new trailers of the job, little Indiana Jones, five set pictures, some films that are going to streaming that, have, that are causing some strong reactions on the internet, and this possibility of Namor being cast as the villain or perhaps antagonist of Wakanda Forever and some of the reactions that have come out from people on social media due to the actors rumor to the due to the rumored actors tweets and what have you so we're getting into all of that today uh as well so uh let, let's just introduce ourselves hi i am the outlaw john roca writer and producer host here on the geek buddies and the outlaw nation i am michael vogel writer and producer of animated tv shows and movies and this is Shannon McClung. I'm an animation writer and a television actor where you may have seen me on Brooklyn Nine-Nine, The Goldbergs, and Silicon Valley. Nice. And is this the official, first official time where all three of us are on mics? Is that correct? <laughs> Michael, have you cooked up your mic yet? Oh. I have not hooked up. It's just, it's my just mic sitting yet. there staring it's been, at you. It's sitting, sitting, it's sitting right over here. I can, I can, I'm looking at this new mic that I bought for uh for geek buddies and it's right there and yeah uh it's just it's been a little bit of a hectic week over here so i've not uh quite Understood. gotten to the five seconds that it will take to actually hook it up but but the soon though guys <laughs> soon the plug and play is tough that's for sure uh all right well anyway <laughs> let's uh <laughs> let's get into how things work here on the show for those of you who are new Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. And if you're listening to us on the podcast feed, welcome and thank you again. For those of you who've been here with us for the long haul, thank you very much for staying on the Geek Buddies train. We appreciate it madly as we keep building out the world of the Geek Buddies. It's you all who have been here for the, the longest that we really appreciate the most for sure. Um, but this is how the show works. Each of us presents a Geek News item. We talk about it amongst ourselves, then take a little bit of a mini break and get into our main topic. And as I said earlier, the main top topic is is the name more uh, a rumor for Wakanda forever. All right, Shannon, I think you're starting us off. Is that correct? I am with trailers, trailers, trailers. Hey. So today we actually have a teaser, a trailer, and a first look behind the scenes of an upcoming streaming series. So we'll start wow. with the short one first because this came out a couple of days ago. This We got to see the first 27-second teaser for DC League of Super Pets. So it was announced a little while ago that The Rock was going to be voicing Crypto the Super Dog, but we also found out a little bit about his supporting cast. Kevin Hart is going to be playing Ace the Bat Hound. Uh, we don't know who they're playing, but we know that Keanu Reeves is going to be joining them, John Krasinski, Kate McKinnon, Natasha Leone, Vanessa Bear, and Diego Luna. Mm. So sometimes when uh, you announce a project, sometimes you literally just need a name and a property for people to get interested. And anytime that name is The Rock and anytime that property has something to do with a comic book, people automatically are going to start talking. So this is actually coming out next May 2022 by the time that we will all be back in the theaters comfortably, I'm assuming. Um, but yeah, I mean, The Rock going all in on DC. Gentlemen, what do we think of this cast announcement? And what do we think of the first look at Crypto? Mike? Um... Well, I mean, yeah, look, yeah, I, they've clearly been working on this movie for a while uh, because if it's coming out next year, it's been in development, they've been working on it. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm sure that like once they locked in The Rock as the voice, that's when they were like, let's make the big announcement. So you, you get a little bit of a sense of what the look of the movie is with like look of crypto in the teaser. And it looks like a good, solid, high-end CG uh, movie. Um, and look, The Rock and Kevin Hart have a long history of live action movies together, including the very successful Jumanji franchise. They play off each other really well. So uh, pretty guaranteed that this is a crypto ace buddy movie uh, with the rest of the uh, super pets and supporting roles. And I'm kind of here for it. Like, I mean, have no idea what it is really, but, uh, you know, I, I like crypto. Um, I like ace. I think the Dwayne, I think Dwayne the Rock Johnson and Kevin Hart are fun. And so as of right now, this would be higher on my list of DC movies that I am excited about than some of the others 
that are currently happening. <laughs> <laughs> currently, some of the others that also have the rock in them. <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. And yeah, and his workouts for the love of God. Uh, but no, this this is so interesting. So you get to voice crypto and you get to be Black Adam in the same overall DC universe. That tells you the power of the rock to be two separate superheroes at the same time. And of course, he is going to, or Dwayne Johnson, whatever you want to call him this uh, this week. But he, this is, uh, when you saw the announcement, it had the hashtag seven bucks. That's his production company. This is an incredible amount of stuff that he is doing with this production company. I remember way back when, when I interviewed the Baywatch, I sat down with a couple of guys in the green room from his production company, and they were talking about these ideas that they were having for the future of the company and how they were making these deals and talking to certain people and exploring possibilities. And it's incredible to see what they've done. And ladies and gentlemen, it isn't just animation. It isn't just superhero movies. They are starting a football league. They're bringing back XFL. That's under the same production window uh, or sorry, production, production umbrella uh, that all this other stuff is under. So it's an incredible thing that the rock is doing diversifying and all of that my only disappointment with this 27 second trailer is we didn't hear him say a word we didn't even hear him say anything at all i mean you could have gotten some look i could have let him borrow a mic if he wanted to say one line they could have put it on there and edited in there for sure but this is also not his first time but editing or uh, voicing over a role obviously as we saw with uh with moana he had a great job doing that character in Moana as well, the Demi God. So um, overall, I like that they're involved. The animation looks cool, and they used the John Williams score, which I'm sure made Michael very happy. Uh, but uh, yeah, those are my thoughts overall. I'm excited. I like the cast, and we'll see where it goes. Do you have anything to add there, Vogel? It sounded like you did. Uh, yeah, I would give you a, just regarding him not saying anything, I would give you yeah. a almost 100% guarantee that what that teaser trailer is, is the test walk cycle of crypto ah. that they did to test the animation that they said, let's get a teaser out really quickly to announce the voice cast now that we've locked it. And that the reason that he's not talking is because there was no lip flap and that was just a walk cycle. I could be wrong about that, <laughs> but that very much looks like a, hey, the walk cycle looks good. Put it on a black screen, slap John Williams on there and let's tell them who else is in the movie. And we will further down the road, get a more detailed trailer about what's going on once they have some more animation. Can yeah, I ask both. you a question for people who don't know what a walk, a walk cycle might be who are listening to us? Mike, can you explain what a walk cycle is yeah. real quick? So when you're really doing, when you're doing early animation tests for uh, a character uh, or the first character for a movie to figure out what the look of the movie is, to figure out does this character design work uh, or does this character look good or how does it walk? Because, uh, you know, before you get into character animation and facial expressions and all the cool little details that make a character great, like they've got to be able to walk across the screen and you got to figure that out. So uh, I'm sure as they were developing the look for what this DC Super Pets movie was going to look like, they did walk cycles for the core cast probably before they even had the voices locked in. So mm -hmm. probably for a while now they've said this is what the movie, even when they went to The Rock and said, hey, we want you to be the voice of Crypto. So here's what he looks like. And he, they probably showed him more or less what we saw on screen. Um, and yeah, it is called a walk cycle because it is literally, these are the way that you, this is the way you move your legs, arms, or four legs mm. in Crypto's case as you walk across the screen. Okay. And the and the lip flap, which Vogel also also uh, referenced. Um, little little more on the nose. It's just how the mouth moves. <laughs> <laughs> now, do we think? Do you think the villain will be Mechanic Cat? Do you think the villain will be? I mean, that's that was the villain in the animated series. So, who would who would you bet on to be the voice if it is Mechanic Cat? Does Keanu Reeves make sense? Do we think Kevin Hart is going to play the antagonist rather than his pal? What, what do we think is happening? Well, well no, Kevin Hart is Kev Kevin Hart is he's, Ace. Okay. I mean, that was right, the, right. he's, he's Ace the Bat Hound. Oh, gotcha. I'm sorry. Ace the Bat Hound. Got it. Okay. So what do we who do we think Mechanic had? Do you think that's Krasinski? Keanu? If, if it happens? Could be. I I would be really excited if maybe they expanded. I mean, I don't at this literally, we know nothing. I would love yep. a Legion of doom dogs or doom pets or whatever like i would love to see like lex luther's pet and the scarecrow's pet go up against them we'll see i don't know if we're gonna go let's go like let's go all in let's go all the way okay. all you right. know lex has an evil goldfish up in that office yeah that, i feel like that. i feel i feel like lex would have like a hairless cat <laughs> you think they'd go full full james bond with it i mean so, really uh, hairless cat 
for a hairless guy. I don't know. It seems like a <laughs> it seems like an easy one for me. Look, crypto's got a rogues gallery. You got Barump Rump, you got Black Beak, Bud and Lou, the Pirates, Mutsy, uh, Dog Bot. There's a Dog Bot, Super Flea, the Bad News Birds, Griff, oh. Ignatius, oh. Waddle. I'm aware. And Katie. I'm just saying for people who I'm are gonna watching say, or listening. <laughs> I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that I don't think crypto's rogues gallery, I don't think that bench runs as deep or as high quality as, say, <laughs> Spidey's or Batman's. I'm open to some reinterpretation. Okay. That's all I'm That's saying. Fair. All right. <laughs> well, DC okay. League of Super Fets will be coming out in May 2022. Our next trailer is our second look at Space Jam A New Legacy, which is coming out in July. We didn't get a ton more in the story here, mm. but we do get some more really great footage and some really funny moments that I think uh, Space Jam is going to be a blast to see in the theater. You get, you get, a, you get a fun little uh, knuckle bump between the Iron Giant and King Kong. This movie looks like a blast. I mean, they didn't, I, I don't know what else you can show to get people into the theaters for this movie, but what did you guys think? <sighs> look, uh, <laughs> here, look, I love LeBron. I, I, I absolutely love LeBron James. I defend LeBron James. I think LeBron James one of been, has been one of the most important sports figures uh, 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 at all, ever. Ever in the history of our um, time on this planet, and and some people might be upset about that, but what he's done, the the uh, projects he's produced, the way he's helped the community, his communities, the charity work he's done, the amount of uh, even you know when people gave him crap about the decision, all that money he raised uh, for that event where he announced he was going to Miami, which was you know a terrible event for him, they all went to a boys and girls club. So that's the, you know these are these things that he does. He's always giving back. He speaks out on social justice issues in a way that Michael Jordan never effing did. He does the right thing a lot of the time. You may hate him on the court. You'd be mad that he winds the reps. Whatever. That's aside from what the man does off the court. And it's incredible. So to see him stepping into this situation, I was kind of hesitant because this is these are these are footsteps that Michael Jordan created and walked in first. And I was worried about him following in his footsteps because everyone compares these two guys now in the sports world. And I thought, this is a good-looking trailer. This is a beautiful-looking movie. I love that they're going live-action, kind of, as a change to the original, where they went live-action into animation and never went back until the end. This is live-action uh, a combo as well, which I enjoy. But um, I haven't laughed once in any of, the, any of the moments in the entire time that I'm watching this thing. And, I'm, and I love Looney Tunes, so I, I'm a little confused about why I haven't enjoyed it and of course there's the the requisite kevin hart joke in there but like i just didn't find any humor in any of this i'm gonna see it hoping i just have a good time but i don't know if i'm gonna laugh at all so that was my feeling interesting vogel i thought it was great <laughs> i was into it <laughs> uh... <laughs> all right man um I mean, just be, first, really quickly, like, I mean, I think they did a really smart thing in this one that they didn't do in the first one, which is that when LeBron goes to the Looney Tunes world, he's a Looney Tune. He's fully yes. animated. Yes. I think that sort of, it sidesteps a lot of the weird, look, it is hard for an actual actor to work in a green screen looking at nothing and actually responding and so for someone who's not fully an actor to do that is even harder so I think that LeBron being fully cartoon in those moments and able to like interact as a cartoon like Kevin Hart joke and everything and uh, I think that's a really smart move. I think the yeah. other thing, just from a visual standpoint, and this is kind of what Johnny's talking about a little bit, is that when the Looney Tunes come to like the main core in the big game, when we have all the Warner Brothers cameos and everything, we get two looks for the Looney Tunes, which didn't yeah. happen in the original Space Jam either. Like when they are in the Looney Tune world, they're fully 2D, but when they come in, we get these really cool CG versions. So I just think visually, even putting aside all the cameos and the other fun stuff because of the way they've set up this world, just looking at the Looney Tunes and LeBron, which is like the meat of this movie, I think this is already visually way more interesting and stunning than Space Jam 1. Um, I, I, I think, that. you know, Looney Tunes humor, it... It sometimes doesn't qu play like fully great in trailers. Like it, some you know you got you got to see it in context and whatever. But like I'll say that what I really liked about this second trailer was that when we really saw them go loony at the end on the court, when you saw the Road Runner running around, uh, the beat with Yosemite Sam shooting the basketball, and especially for me the Wiley e. Coyote moment at the end really sold me. I was like, all right, this is great, Wiley e. Coyote, Acme device, you got messed up. 
it worked. Like to me, I'm like, I'm checking the boxes watching this and I'm like, this feels like Looney Tunes to me. And mm -hmm. I would go so far as to even say that just given the setup, given the money that they clearly put into this, given the scale of this movie, uh, I may like it more than the first Space Jam if what they are promising in these trailers all gets delivered. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I would I would agree with you. Like the moment that four Wiley Wiley Coyotes were shot out, and you had the 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 four successive signs. What have I done? I'm like, that's that's fantastic. Like that is 100 yeah. percent the Looney Tunes that I remember watching as a kid. Yeah. Well, now now to be out. fair, oh. to be fair, you and I are much younger than John. So oh, right. his experience right, 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 right. with yeah. the Looney Tunes yeah. is different right. than our yeah. experience with the. Just so we're clear. Right, you if this was a big it. screen adaptation of <laughs> Steamboat right. Willie, John would be all on board. So you can tell by the numerous amounts of gray hairs on both of the other gentlemen and none of them on mine, how much more <laughs> younger they are than I am. But yes, of course, let's, let's go forward. What's next, Shannon? <laughs> <laughs> and lastly, we got, uh, just today, we got a but our first look, a behind the scenes look at the Netflix adaptation of Neil Gaiman's Sandman. Yeah. So this is a property that that they have been trying to do on the big screen for a very long time. I feel like they started they tried to do it in the 90s. Joseph Gordon Levitt was attached to star and direct it uh, you know, a few years ago. It's finally coming to Netflix. And the great thing about this 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 video, which I runs between like two and a half, three minutes, I think. Um Neil Gaiman is is talking about the world of Sandman, and he's talking about the the road it took to production, and it's him walking around on the sets. Like you're getting to see some of the some of the practical special effects they're doing, and I you know a lot of people have feelings about some of the casting. I am not one of those people. I think all the moves that they've made to me make perfect sense, and I'm excited to see them. Gwendolyn Christie as Lucifer, like, awesome. Bring it. Mm -hmm. um, such a cool, cool video. And it's not often that you get the creator um, as part of the part of the process. And, you know, he's one of the, I, I don't know if they're three showrunners, but it's but it's Neil Gaiman, uh, David Goyer, and one of the, the guy who actually came up with the story for Wonder Woman, a writer named, mm. uh, ah, gosh, I just lost his name here. Um, yeah, yeah, Alan Heinberg, who, who, is, who is also uh, a, a big TV writer, worked on The Catch. Um, yeah, I mean, this video, I thought, just got me so incredibly excited. Uh, I was not a big Sandman fan. I tried to read the comic. I just couldn't get into it. But listening to the Audible series really got me into it so i could tell john is ready to pull his not gray no, hair mean, out sorry, because I've i never... didn't because i didn't really click with the comic <laughs> i'm sorry i'm sorry <laughs> i just know you like to talk about like you know you like to talk about theoretical things every once in a while existential things we've had conversations before so i'm surprised that that wasn't something you necessarily uh gravitated to but the fact that the audible series worked for you is a good thing michael's the one who introduced me to these things and if it hadn't been for michael i don't think i ever i, I don't think i ever knew about them i mean i had this before i had uh, red sandman i had his his eternals you know guyman's eternals before i read sandman so to to jump into that i remember that was a phenomenal read and watching this video made me want to go and I, tomorrow i may go out to a comic book shop and buy them all because i don't own them I buy the compendium if they have them because i want to pour into this thing big time mikey uh, yeah, they actually have, if you really want to spend some money, which I do because I like spending money, you can buy the big oversized uh, deluxe uh, comic book editions, which I think I have all of them now, but they're like wow. giant and just, you just like the pages are huge and uh, it's definitely worth it. If you're a Sandman fan, it's worth it to have the uh, epic deluxe giant size edition on your shelf. Mm. I was super excited. Like, like as Johnny said, you know, I've been a Sandman fan for years. I introduced it to Johnny. I tried to introduce it to Shannon. And uh, I will say that the reason Shannon didn't <laughs> like it is because Shannon did not like the artwork. And he couldn't get past the fact that he did not love how it looked. So he didn't really want to read it. And that is why the Audible series worked so well for him. Because he didn't have to look at art that he did not find pleasing to his discerning eye. Wow. Um, 
but uh, but yeah, what I, I what I thought was great about this was uh, they did a really good thing. I think because it's been in development for so long, and because everyone has uh, such strong feelings about Sandman, I think mm -hmm. having Neil Gaiman uh, kind of do this behind the scenes walkthrough, where you're seeing some of these images from the comic book just come to life, and you're seeing his excitement about it, and you're mm -hmm. seeing, I mean, I believe he says in there that this is a show for Sandman fans created by Sandman fans. And that yeah. basically the whole point of this uh, behind the scenes look is to really sort of let everybody know uh, that they're taking this really seriously and that this is this is a big, big deal. Like they're not, mm -hmm. it doesn't look like they're cheaping out on everything and on anything. And just seeing some of the locations, uh, if, you're, if you're a fan of the Gosh. comics, you know, you can oh look at this with yeah. an eagle eye and you see, uh, you see a bunch of scenes, you see a bunch of places, you see some things in the background, and yeah. you really start to contextualize, oh, this is this, oh, this is from this book, oh, this is from this issue. Uh, and I, I started to get really excited. I mean, I, I um, as, as Shannon uh, mentioned, like the Audible series uh, of Sandman, if you have not listened to it, you should absolutely do it. If you've read the comics, it's amazing to hear it come to life. If you've not read the comics, uh, like Shannon, it's a great way to sort of introduce yourself to the world. And it's yeah. such a rich world. Uh, and so I think like, I highly recommend that. And like, as far as I'm concerned, the more Sandman, the better. The fact that we're gonna get more of the Audible series and they're gonna go through the rest of the, uh, the, the graphic novels and we have this Netflix series coming, like I truly could not be more excited. Yeah. yeah. Like we do oh, sorry. Go ahead, John. No, no. Go ahead, go ahead, Shannon. Well, no, I was going to well, no, wrap it up. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I thought this video was incredible. Uh, I, if I can recommend you guys going to see uh, the Nerdist video, Dan Casey did a great uh, Easter eggs look through that video. That's oh, about cool. six. And, it's about six and a half, seven minutes long, pulling out things that we saw, like the bag of sand that Constantine buys at that uh, at that yard sale, the big suitcase, the tiny furniture. What is that referring to? All the stuff that, so, you know, of course, the necklace is really highlighted in that moment as well. But yeah, when he wants it, it walks into what's it called again? The under under where he's being held by Burgess in the yeah. thing under under whatever it is. Like he walks into it and you see Neil Gaiman's reacts like, oh, my God. And he said <laughs> it's like having them bring my mind out into real life, which is so ironic because in essence, when you're reading uh, Sandman, he is kind of maybe exploring some things that you've maybe quietly had thoughts about, and he's bringing them onto the page for you to contemplate and think about and look at. So kind of ironic to see it going in the other direction for him here. But so great to see the meticulous attention to detail, the designs, the looks, when they were showing the difference, uh, the, the the comparison to the uh, a comic book shot of Dream going through the portal there versus what they've got storyboarded. It was great to look at all of that and understand like, they are spending money. Look, they spent two hundred million damn dollars on Jupiter's legacy, and that thing sank like a stone. So hopefully, they're spending <laughs> the same kind of money here, and it's going to be a success. So I, I was very, very excited by this. Two minutes was nowhere near enough. I wanted it to be fifteen to twenty minutes. So fantastic! I, I I'm gonna go buy these things like tomorrow, man. Yeah, fully, fully agree. Like listening to that Audible series, it's like they did such a good job on that. That I mean, I could, I could see the movie in my head. I could see mm -hmm. certain scenes. Like, oh, when they make this, this is how, this is how it's gonna play out. Like, it looks right. just incredible. Now they don't have a release date, I don't believe, but they are wrapping no. filming this month. And mm -hmm. considering the amount of post production work that's gonna be on, gonna be required, my yeah. guess is we probably won't be seeing this until spring twenty twenty two. Maybe maybe yeah. summer. That's yeah. that's that's my guess. But yeah. those are the trailers for today, folks. Are you excited? What, what has been the cast issue? I mean, I, I like Gwendolyn Christie as Lucifer. I love the idea of Boyd Holbrook coming in as the Corinthian. Holy Mary, mother of God. I totally forgot about the serial convention. And when they showed that sign in the trailer, <laughs> I was smashing my head with a hammer like, oh, my God. <laughs> so it's like it's that kind of stuff that you're like, oh, man. You hope they get everything here. And having Patton Oswalt be a part of this, too, is exciting as well. So there's so many incredible talent here, Mike, don't you think? Oh, I think the talent's great. Uh, I think what Shannon's yeah. referring to is that there are people uh, yes. who feel that some of the uh, changes to ethnicity or sex oh. or gender fluid or trans oh, uh, performers uh, yeah. is inappropriate. 
it. Okay. And uh, Neil Gaiman has been really, really clear about his opinion on that. And yeah. look, uh, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, yeah. Enjoy your Neil, island. Enjoy your. It island. came out. Of, it came out of Neil Gaiman's head, and as he has said, and as he pointed out very specifically, even in reading the original Sandman comics, uh, all of the endless appeared to any person the way that they always thought those people would look. So yep. the endless or beyond uh, specific ethnicities or looks or genders even. So I think that yeah. it's pretty well documented in the comics that that's the case. And so if you're mad about it now, I don't know what to tell you. Go, go, uh, do go what talk, you do. Go talk to your picture of the white Jesus Christ. All right, right, let's. Uh, what's the next thing we got here, Shan? Is it me or is it Michael? What's next? No, I think the next is Michael, yeah. All right, Michael, take it Guys, on, my man. It's- going to take me a while to cover this one. (laughs) Indiana Jones 5 started filming. And there's a picture on the internet of it. And that's the story. (laughs) Uh, Now, (laughs) to be fair, seeing Harrison Ford uh, put on the suit and walk around is actually big news. And there was a ton of photos going around on the internet uh, about this. And so it's, it's nice. Uh, there's a couple other photos. You know, you know, like some days, you know, your friend takes a photo of you, and the one friend takes a photo over here, and the lighting was right, and you looked really good, and you're like, "Ooh, I gotta post that real quick." And then your other friend took a photo of you, and you are like, "Holy shit! Why didn't anybody tell me I look like this?" Uh, like you know those moments where you're like, you're like looking at your phone, and you accidentally hit the the camera, and all of a sudden, like from below shoots up, and you're like, "Is that what I look like?" So, like, look, there's been a couple of photos of Harrison Ford in the indie outfit that have made their way to the internet that uh, people have been a little bit uh, not sure about. Is he still of the age where he should be wearing it? He looks a little elderly. But I think in the pictures Johnny showed, you see, like, look, that's that's indie. And I think that seeing that this is real, seeing that it's actually happening, you know, you got Kathleen Kennedy there. I believe that's Frank Marshall, maybe next to him, too. uh, And, uh, you know, you see the team back together. You see him on set. You see Harrison Ford doing his thing. And look, we've talked about this. Like, what is this movie going to be? I believe we talked about it when we were talking about uh, just the fact that this was happening. And the idea that, like, Harrison Ford is older. And if they lean into an older indie, I think that can be great. If if they got Harrison Ford jumping around like he was in Raiders, it, it may get a little wonky. But, uh, but I, for one, am happy to see him back in action. And, uh, you know, I... I can't wait to hear more about what this movie is actually about to know if I am Last Crusade excited or Crystal Skull concerned. (laughs) So, you know, as we've covered, I I am a huge Indiana Jones fan. I may or may not have a Raiders t-shirt on right now. Yeah, (laughs) not thirsty. Um, So... Yeah, I mean he he is uh, he he is an older gentleman. Um, his age was not the reason Crystal or Kingdom of the Crystal Skull didn't work. Like there were many reasons that that movie did not work for me for me at least. Um, they also there are also some set picks out there that show sort of a World War II setting, which gives us a hint that okay, there's going to be a flashback at some point. And I did not see this photo, but apparently there was a there was a a, a stuntman on set doing a motorcycle chase that was wearing a Harrison Ford mask. So it's like, okay, so we're going to get a de-aged indie more than likely. Um, Yeah. I, I, at this point, like, I I think you guys are bigger fans of Logan than I was. I did really like Logan. Um, My only hope, my fingers are crossed that in, in Mangold, in Mangold, we trust right now. I think, I think he's a really, really good filmmaker. I don't think he would have taken on, what is ostensibly Harrison Ford's last go around, his final chapter as Indy, if he didn't think he could nail it. Yeah. Um, that being said, I don't think Spielberg and Lucas thought they were making what turned out to be Crystal Skull when they were making it. Mm-hmm. Um, so fingers crossed, fingers crossed. Well, at least someone younger is on the set and that helps with James Mangold um, overall. But look at this. I mean, in my mind, is i don't know what to say man i just feel like it shouldn't be happening he's too old and i don't want to hurt anybody's feelings but he's too damn old it's different than luke like luke coming back luke's been on that island in octo he's been doing his thing yeah that's different situation 
This is a guy who essentially now is a superhero because his costume is the same in every fucking movie. Is there no fashion change? Is there no fa is there, like does he not up res the look? I just I'm just confused because he keeps getting older. And if he stays in the same period of World War II, you got to ask yourself, what the fuck happened? Like, was that arc messing with you more than we thought? Uh, I just need to know what is happening here because, like, he's got to be in the 1970s at this point or 1980s even. And why is he still wearing the same clothes? I just feel weird about that overall. I get the iconic hat, but does he have to wear the same clothes? I just, to me, it's like, we've gotten to that point. Was it? Uh, I just don't know, man. Like, if we saw set photos of him wearing, like, you know, uh, a Hawaiian shirt with palm trees on it with a hat, I don't know that I'm going to be excited for that movie. Like, I, I would I agree. Send... <laughs> I, and you know what? I wouldn't agree with that extreme reaction either. So I don't think I want him in palm trees. Just something a little more updated. That's all overall. I just, Bull you can't run in those palm shoes. shoes. Bull whips. Yeah, well, look, at 80 years old, you can't run in those soft moccasins anymore, son. No, you can't do that at 80 years old. That's death. That's twisted ankles and broken knees. Come on. Maybe he's got insoles in them. We, we don't know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, I do think, you know, like to, to that point, I mean, like, and it's like I said, I mean, like, even to your point about Luke, like, yeah, we can say that now because we've seen Last Jedi. So we can say it was different for Luke. He was on the island the whole time. He was chilling on Octo and because we know the context. But before right. we got to the Star Wars movies, we didn't know. So similar here. We don't know the context. It could be whatever. I mean, to, with Mangold did an amazing job with P Patrick Stewart as Professor X yes, and did. letting him be old and letting that be a part of the story. So much so that when Feige rumored, uh, you know, when it was rumored that Feige approached Patrick Stewart about, you know, coming back to yep. be Charles Xavier in phase four or five of the MCU, that Patrick Stewart said no because he felt like that was the right way to end his story as Professor X. So I, you know, just given what Mangle did in Logan, it's like, I, I would like to see it. Cause I do, I agree with John in that if we just pretend that Indy, that Indy, that Dr. Jones in his sixties, seventies, whatever age they set him as is running around like he always was, I think that's going to be a little weird, but yeah. I think the, even the fact that there's apparently a flashback sequence, and the idea that something from Indy's past is coming back to today or today for him, uh, that could be interesting. And seeing him be past his prime and seeing him be at an age where he shouldn't be doing this, but for reasons must do it once more, could be the right way to send off Indy. It depends on the story. So there's a lot depending on how they're handling this. Uh, yeah. And I do think what we're all kind of saying is Harrison Ford's age is a factor here and you yep. can either ignore it or lean into it. And I think you ignore it at your own peril. My fear is the Irishman when De Niro's trying Oof. to kick the crap out of that grocer. And my fear is grudge match with De Niro and Stallone. That's my fear. And I sure. don't want to see that. I don't want to see that, but you might be right. And of course, Mangold, you know, I have his poster behind me for a reason. I love that damn movie so much. Uh, I do trust him to do the right thing here. You just hope that uh, if they do get it right overall for the sake of the character, because Crystal Skull left a really bad taste in a lot of people's mouths, that's for sure. Um, all right, anything else on this one, Shan? Uh, Michael, anything else on this one? That's all I got. All right, well, thank you so much. All right, let's move on uh, to another item here and some movies that have been re uh, announced that they are going to go to streaming. Uh, one that really got a strong reaction from some of my fellow Latino critics and Latina critics here online was this announcement that Blue Beetle will be exclusively on HBO Max, joining Batgirl as well exclusively on HBO Max. This was trumpeted as the first Latino-led superhero movie here in the DC universe. Uh, Charm City Kings director Angel Manuel Soto was going to is going to direct it rather, uh, and it's going to follow Jaime Reyes, you know, the Mexican American hero who takes over the mantle from Ted Kord to be Blue Beetle, uh, and, uh, and it was going to have two, you know, it's going to be his two friends Paco and Brenda were going to be a part of this thing, but they've just now announced. Uh, that is going to go to, HB, uh, to HBO Max exclusively, that's according to the LA Times, and not get a theatrical release. So uh, I will say, I will stop here and then we'll go to the other ones, but uh, I, this really pissed me off. This, I mean, I'm just, and to be honest, 
There may be reasons for the budgetary issues, what have you, but don't fucking trumpet how you're going to be diverse and you're going to crow about it as a studio. And then the first Latino superhero, you're going to dump it onto HBO Max. Not even a day and date release in the theaters. That would have been at least a middle ground. But to just dump it on HBO Max is just a film to go and watch while you're home. And don't. And I know they're going to try to PR the F out of this by being like, oh, well, it's for everybody. Now everybody can watch more people. You can share with families, blah, blah, blah. Bull crap. We need to know what we can do in these theaters. We need to see studios behind us promoting these movies, pushing these movies, and they announced this on the week that In the Heights is coming out to really be an explosive, an explosion, rather, of Latino power in the theater, and we want to see what the box office is going to be like for that film. So, I mean, making Blue Beetle go this direction is really, really frustrating for me overall as a, as a Latino, uh, and uh, I don't know. There's no excuse they can give me that makes any damn sense to me at all. Uh, because so many people involved in this uh, are of Latin origin, and we were very proud to have this happening. And now that it's going to HBO Max is a bit frustrating. Um, the other news we have here is that Batgirl is also going to be going straight to HBO Max. We know all the history of Batgirl with having Joss Whedon and everything that got involved with that. But now that is also going to go to HBO Max. And then Rob Zombie, apparently they're letting him still do movies. He's doing a Monsters uh, remake of this or reboot. Uh, and that movie is apparently going straight to Peacock as opposed to a theatrical release. He said on his social media, tension boils and ghouls. The rumors are true. My next film project will be the one I've been chasing for 20 years, The Monsters. Stay tuned for exciting details as things progress. Um, I hope there's no serial killers or rape scenes or porn stars in this city or, or aged porn stars in this version of The Monsters, Rob Zombie. Please stay the fuck away from all that kind of shit. Uh, and I, I, you know, I saw your Halloween. Uh, I saw your Devil's Rejects. Ugh. So I'm just like not happy about any of this. But what do you guys think about these big movies or kind of uh, trumpeted movies heading straight to streaming as theaters are opening, as studios are desperate to try to get their stuff back in the theaters, and as AMC stock is riding sky high. You know, uh, I, I think it's it's two different conversations because I think like the Munsters doing that as a film, like the Munsters has not had the staying power that the Adams family has. Mm -hmm. um, but you doing the Munsters as a feature that you put on Peacock, like Peacock um, is I think is doing OK as a streamer because you do have a lot of things that people want to see. Like, you know, people yeah. love love having access to the office. So. Throwing something up there like, I mean, Rob Zombie's The Munsters, I mean, that's definitely good. That'll get some eyeballs. Um, as For far sure. as the DC properties are concerned, I'm, I'm, I'm a little more conflicted because you know Zatanna mm. as well. They have said is yes. is going to be going to going to HBO Max. Like if you look at like Netflix, like they don't skimp on the budgets for their movies. It appears. Nope. I mean, like Army uh, Army of the Dead, like that was that was that was a big that was a big movie. Mm -hmm. um, they also don't traditionally release their films in theaters. Uh, you know, with HBO Max, uh, the reason that we got the day and date for 2021 is because of COVID. Like, that is 100% uh, the reason. <laughs> um, so when you have the option to release it in a theater, um, I, I think, there, I think there's, a, there's a point of view that... Mm -hmm. You're you're releasing this movie straight on streaming. When you do have a theatrical outlet, the the it could be misconstrued as oh you're you're you might be doing this on the cheap. You you might not be putting as much behind it as you would something that you're going to release nationwide. And why you would want to do a Blue Beetle movie where you can't put everything that you have into it, um, I, I I don't I don't understand the reasoning. But also streaming, it's it's the wave of the future. I mean maybe. Maybe they are going to put everything they into everything into it that they would something like the Suicide Squad that's coming out in August. Uh, Mikey, what do you think about this? I mean, I think we're going to see more and more of this. I think that we're going to see movies. I, I understand what you're saying about the budgetary thing, and I think that's mm -hmm. a concern. I also think probably that's not the case here. Uh, I think that as these streamers are trying to like keep their audiences, get people excited, there's definitely a level of, well, the DC fan base is huge and will come to HBO Max to see this. So let's try and like build out a business there. 
I don't, I don't know that that's the right call, and I don't disagree with a lot of John's issues uh, with taking your first major Latino hero and not giving him a theatrical release. But I do think that they're probably, it's less about budgetary, we don't want to spend the money. And again, this is me just guessing. But yeah. uh, it's less about a budgetary thing and more about let's try and like have, this is our DC level superheroes that are going to be in the f theaters, and then let's have a whole second tier. Here, here's the problem though. And yep. I'm a broken record because I say this every time it comes up, but nobody felt like Miss Marvel was getting short shrift on Disney Plus getting her own TV show because we have seen, A, the quality that Marvel is putting into their TV shows right now. A thousand percent. And yes. B, there is an understanding that those TV shows are in the exact same universe as the movies. Yep. So not only will the quality be the same, not only will the caliber of acting be the same, not only will the caliber of effects be the same, these characters are now part of the world and we can assume that we will see them on the big screen. Yep. So with Miss Marvel, and we already know that's true with Miss Marvel because this Captain Marvel 2 is called Marvels. And we know that she is gonna be in that movie. And so I, I as Johnny was talking about it, it just strikes me again and again and again. And again, it's not me saying that DC has to have a connected universe the way that Marvel does. DC can do whatever the hell they want. DC mm -hmm. should just let everybody know what it is they're doing. Because I think part of the upset here is, is that there's no understanding, well, is this going to be a lower budget Blue Beetle movie that stands on its own and doesn't have anything to do with Aquaman or Wonder Woman or the Flash movie? Or are Zatanna and Batgirl and uh, Jaime being set up as a younger age group of superheroes who will then level up into the world with Wonder Woman and Batman and Flash and whoever. And maybe that's the case and maybe that'll be amazing. And a year from now or two years from now, when that turns out to be the case, we'll all be like, oh, that was awesome. Jaime Reyes is super popular. He's gonna be in Flash too. This is so great. But the fact that we don't know that and don't understand that compared to what we do get from Marvel is I think what causes a lot of this upset. That's an incredibly excellent point, Mike. I hadn't even thought of that. If they had just announced that they were going to do go this route, our expectations would have changed. Our perception of this would have changed. You're right. Because look, Moon Knight, led by a Latino in Oscar mm -hmm. Isaac playing what is typically a white character, Mark Spector, uh, it's a great moment. And it's okay that it's going to Marvel because we know they're going to connect up. And they've yeah. already said they're going to connect up to the larger universe. This is a great point. Batgirl was one that Kevin Smith was super pissed about apparently recently and went on a tirade. He said, hold up, hold on, Mark. And this is on his podcast after he had found out you know, that Adil and Bilal, Bilal were going to be directing. The guys who had, by the way, the, I think the number one uh, box office movie in 2020 with uh, with Bad Boys for Life, they're taking on uh, Batgirl here. But he found out about the streaming decision by the w, uh, by uh, WB and DC to put Batgirl on streaming on HBO Max. And then here's his quote. Hold up. Hold on, Mark. He's talking uh, to Mark Bernard and there is co-host on the show. I have to call the mayor of Hollywood. What are you nuts? How is just how is this just a streaming series and not a fucking like they got Wonder Woman. But I'm like, take Wonder, throw bat, take woman off, put girl, make the same amount of money like they could be printing big fucking dollars. It's a billion dollar franchise if handled correctly and you cast it right. Oh, shit. And they're just going to let it be. A, Look, there are wonderful streaming series. I'll fight any. Anybody who says Hacks isn't one of the greatest fucking series of all time. I agree. I'm, by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm watching that right now. Now airing on HBO, and I'm not even a paid fucking advocate. I'm just a big fan. But I would not have thought they would take Batgirl in this direction. Maybe a spin-off animated series, sure. But that smells like a movie to me. So certainly I'm not the only one who's pissed off about some of these decisions that WB is doing. But, Michael, again, you make an excellent point. If they announced this ahead of time, people would have adjusted their expectations and been excited about this kind of mini universe they're creating that they're going to then level up into theatrical films. Shane, yeah. any and thoughts look, on this? Yeah, sorry, Mike. Good. No, no, go ahead, Shane. No, I mean, I, I mean, I agree with you guys. I mean, the again, the the perception is, for, for, you know, from from a certain point of view, is that you're putting less into it, and that's why you're putting it mm -hmm. on the streaming service. Mm -hmm. um, but as Vogel said, we don't think about that with Marvel because everything is known to be interconnected. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, my. I mean, Blue Beetle, I, I don't know how you do Blue Beetle on the cheap. I mean, that seems <laughs> yeah. like it would be a very effects effects heavy project. The same with the same with Satana. Like, could you do Batgirl? I mean, do you need a huge, you know, not necessarily. That's a, Batgirl's a street level hero. You know, could you do the Netflix Daredevil route? Absolutely. Um, but, but I mean, Kevin Smith, I, I don't disagree with his point of view in that 
the the perception is you're not putting everything into it that you could. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'll I'll say this. I think that once we see what they're going to be doing, mm -hmm. if if it does in fact turn out that we all agree that the quality of these films is lower or the effects budget or like if these do feel like they are not movies that are being treated on the same level as the Flash and the Batman movies and everything else, then then they're just dumb. I mean, then it's then it's really, really, really bad. Um, yeah. Presuming that these are going to be full movies with full budgets and that we are going to get like the the full movie experience just on streaming. Again, I just think they need to they need to clue us in on any kind of strategy. It doesn't I like I said, don't copy Marvel. That's super cool. But let us know what the strategy is because again, Warner Brothers biggest uh biggest enemy in all of this is themselves because they keep flip-flopping on, well, we're doing prestige movies and it's not a universe. Oh, well, The Flash is going to do Flashpoint and that's going and Ben Affleck is in it because it's a, like sort of a universe and you're like there's just no rhyme or reason and so it just makes it confusing to sort of keep track of like what we're supposed to be keeping track of. Mhm. Mm yeah, absolutely. Well, we'll see what happens and uh, we'll keep tabs on this as it goes forward. Uh and you hope they and, and you start to wonder, man, Ray Fisher it starts to look a little more uh, correct, a little more on point about some of his comments here. As you see all these changes happening, and of course, it's on the heels of these moves being done with Warner Brothers being uh, AT&T selling off that section of Warner Brothers. So, yeah, a lot to come, I'm sure, as these things kind of shake themselves out. All right, let's take a quick break, and we'll jump into our main topic, talking this rumor that uh, we may have Namor the Submariner in Wakanda forever. We'll be right back after this. Do do boo do boo do boo 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 do boo boo do boo do boo 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 do. Mikey, you got anything on that? I mean, oh yeah, somewhere beyond the sea. Oh, I see what you're doing. Somewhere waiting for me. Yeah. Oh, I got it. I respect it. I don't know if I liked it. But I got oh. it. The choice or the rendition? Oh. Don't answer. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Don't answer. Uh, <laughs> all right. Well, let's get into this story. I'll just I'll just uh, uh, give, the, give the groundwork, and then you guys take off with this thing. Uh, this is coming to us from the Illuminati, and I'm reading this off Empire Magazine. So if Empire is even writing it up, there's a certain level of legitimacy to the possibility that this rumor is true. The Illuminati reported that Tenoch Huerta, who is one of the actors from Narcos, he, who he had been previously cast in the Wakanda Forever film, is playing the iconic Marvel character Namor the Submariner. Again, this is just a rumor, so you don't 100% know if it's going to be true or not. And of course, we know Namor is the son of Atlantean prince and a, a princess and a sailor. Kind of feels similar to a certain DC hero. Uh, he rose to become the king of the aquatic city of Atlantis and defends against intruders. Um, and he was one of the first uh, early Marvel characters created in 1939, ladies and gentlemen by Bill Everett uh, all the way back in Marvel Comics uh, number one. So there's a lot of rumors here going around. First of all, the guy is uh, Mexican. So there's there was a lot of uh, happiness amongst some Latinos that he was going to be cast. A lot of people thought they might go the Asian route. Daniel Day Kim had been rumored as a possibility. A number of other people had been kind of thrown out there as possibilities as well. But right on the heels of this situation, there were uh, some complaints about some tweets that he had, the actor, Tenocho Huerta, had uh, sent across in Spanish. Uh, and I, I'm trying to bring up his, he, one of his uh, tweets was, Feliz Navidad a todos menos a los pobres, inmigrantes, homosexuales, trans, feministas, liberales, indígenas, y no se, y si no entienden que es broma, tampoco para ustedes, which is essentially what he's saying is, Merry Christmas to everybody except the poor, the immigrants, the homosexuals, the transsexuals, feminists, liberals, the indigenous population. And if you don't understand that this is a joke, no uh, Christmas for you. And he shows an empty picture of a manger. Now, Google translated this into English, and this is what seems to be causing the controversy here because he was clearly, at least on my side, from as uh, understanding this in Spanish, making fun of the fact that the extreme right, and he said that this was a joke at the extreme right's expense, 
who are constantly going after these groups that we wouldn't have a Christmas. You wouldn't have a manger scene without these groups involved in this situation. But some people are saying, taking these things in English and running, and they want to cancel this guy. They want to go after this guy. So, gentlemen, what do you take from all of this? Was Is this off-color humor incorrect here? Should he be canceled? Have we gone too far? What do you guys think? It's a simple misunderstanding from Google Translate. What do you guys think? I'll, I'll let I'll let Vogel take the take the take okay. the plunge here. Please. <laughs> this is this is stupid. <laughs> this is stupid. First, like it's just dumb. Uh, he's he's clearly making a joke. It's obvious yeah. what the joke is. Anyone who's online saying that this is not a joke and that he's actually like attacking the trans community or the LGBTQ community or any community aside from far right trolls uh yeah. is wrong and it's obvious they're wrong like this is not even worthy of conversation of a controversy because there's no controversy to controverse like it's just a nothing thing um yeah. and I'm like look i mean a cancel culture is a funny thing to me just because and we've we've argued this and we've debated it i know we probably don't all fully agree on this like i don't know that anyone's ever been canceled we talk about cancel culture a lot right, right. um cnn i mean i'm sorry Fox and the far right media goes crazy talking about how they're all getting canceled. But like my Twitter feed is full of people with millions of views telling me how they're being canceled. And I have to listen to them talking about being canceled. So they're clearly <laughs> not canceled. Like, oh, no. don't know anyone who's actually been canceled. Like there's a whole, yeah. like we talk about this and like, look, if you're on Twitter and you are upset at JK Rowling and don't want to buy Harry Potter books, or you're upset at this guy and and you're not going to go see Wakanda forever. Like, you're right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But this idea that there's some mob of people that are uh, waiting with their pitchforks that are going to run you out of Hollywood. I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm doing it. Don't yeah. know where it is. Um, so that's how I feel about that part. Um, we can talk about the Namor in, yes, in Wakanda please. forever in a minute. But like, no, what do you guys think? Let's, let's cover this part first. <laughs> okay, let's do that. <laughs> well, I mean, look, I mean, Marvel has had their, has had a couple of speed bumps in the road with like, oh, some problematic tweets from 10 years ago came up. I don't think they would have, I mean, granted, they haven't announced his hiring yet. No. Um, but I don't think they would, they would have gone for this guy if anything that he said w was this problematic. I mean, for I think what people love, fans especially love about social media is the accessibility they have to these people that they like to watch on the big screen and small screen, mm -hmm. or or they like to listen to their music. What's going to happen because people, folks, uh, can't really say anything in jest without it getting twisted. And, and and mutated into something that they never meant. What's going to happen is what happened with uh, like Daisy Ridley and Kelly Marie Tran in Star Wars. They're just going to go away because yeah. ultimately it is not worth the headache that follows. I mean, yeah. the the age of social media. This is it's still very very young. Um, and so anyone, I, I, I imagine in the next five to 10 years, if, if you were to drop off social media now, in the next five to 10 years, people could still find stuff that mm -hmm. you said as a joke that, yep. uh, you know, and, and I, I do think studios, and, and, I, and I could be wrong here. I'm, I was never a studio person. My guess though is studios and networks are telling their people, just don't post. Like outside, yeah. of, pro outside of promoting your project, yeah. Just don't post. It's just going to make it a lot easier. And depending on that performer or that that singer, that celebrity, depending on their point of view and their level of success, because you do reach a certain point where it's like, no, F, you know, I got FU yeah. money. Yeah, <laughs> I can do whatever I want. Um, but I think ultimately that is what is going to happen. Yeah, I mean, I, I the the people who are getting canceled seem to be making the most money. This the, they they parlay that like that uh, in Saturday Night Live that uh, country western singer who made those controversial comments, uh, and then bef and then Saturday Night Live took him off as uh, as a performer. His his music skyrocketed on Spotify and on iTunes after they kicked him off the show, or they asked him to step down. Then when he tried to, then when he, they, he said he'd come back, they asked him back. After the controversy had died down, he'd apologized. He canceled on him two days until the show. So clearly, all this stuff is just stuff people are using to promote themselves. 
Corrado hasn't missed a beat. She's making money, and then we're here the the news this week that uh, Cara Dune is coming as a character. And they're still doing merchandise, which reawoke into all the anger, you know, uh, to defend Cara Dune all over again. So no one's or Gina Carano rather, no one's no one's actually been canceled. You may lose a job or you may lose things, but it seems to me like this is uh, what happens overall. You actually there are if you come out in defense of it, you come out angry about it. People stream to defend you. Whoa, people go all in to defend you overall. So um, if this is not that kind of situation. This seems to be just translation issues here and people are running like crazy with it. I should have done more research. Someone posted one of those uh, one of those things to me and, and he's uh, uh, one of my followers uh, and he was like concerned about it. So I took a look at it and I took the tweet down. Now looking at this, clearly this is a, a bit of a mistake overall and a misunderstanding. And it was reported by POC Culture that Black Panther 2 was looking for quote two Mayan characters a woman named Zayanya and a man named Kadmael. Now it seems to be, according to Illuminati, who was the origin of this uh, casting uh, rumor, uh, that that was code words for Namor and Namora, who is Namor's cousin. So we may be getting both the casting decisions coming soon, and they may be both people who of uh, uh, Mexican or indigenous origins or look to be of indigenous origins or Mayan origins. So that could be interesting overall but i like this idea i love namor being a part of this it's something that a lot of us have been speaking about for a while i certainly thought well my idea is that namor is going to come try to take over wakanda uh and uh, you know they're going to fight they're going to unite all the tribes against him and then eventually he's going to realize what he's done and be on the side of wakanda again uh and what else yeah i guess that's basically ed kugel's writing this thing uh, but uh well what else mikey what are you going to say well the one thing i find you know like what marvel does a pretty decent job of, you know, given the fact that everything is so interconnected, is that yeah. when you look at the movies uh, of the individual characters themselves, those movies kind of do follow the track of like picking up where the last one left off. So even yeah. though Thor, you know, for example, ran off to be with the Avengers and was doing this and doing that, like Thor 2 kind of picked up the thread from Thor 1. And even as yeah. different as Ragnarok was, you know, you had to know where that Loki took over over Odin at the end of Thor 2 like they kind of keep it yep. they keep that tight and one part as much as we've as we all have seen of Wakanda uh we should not forget that especially since Coogler's writing the script like Wakanda is the most technologically advanced civilization on the planet that has yeah. been hidden up until the very end of Black Panther. And so the mm -hmm. fact that we will pick up Black Panther 2, uh, all issues of what they're gonna do with Chadwick Boseman and T'Challa aside and how they're gonna handle that, Wakanda mm -hmm. itself is now going to be this global power in a very major way. And so the idea that another hidden civilization would come into play in some way is actually uh, as crazy as it sounds at first to say, oh my God, Namor and everything else, kind of does make sense. And mm -hmm. I actually did recall, um, I think Martin Freeman was on, I forget where it was. Oh, I, yes. can't, I, I can't recall. Yes. But he was talking about, he was talking about his role, uh, him reprising his role in, in Wakanda Forever, and that he was on a Zoom call with Coogler, who was kind of pitching him the new kind of post Chadwick Boseman news story. And Coogler just kept saying, I know it sounds crazy. I know it sounds crazy. Just go with me. It's all going to make sense. I know this is wacky. And, and so like a lot of people just hearing him talk about that, you're like, I feel like Atlantis is really in play here. Like, I feel like this is a thing. So I'm really intrigued to see what I, I kind of feel at this point. My gut is telling me um, that the name, whether, whether this guy is playing Namor or not, Namor coming into the MCU is probably pretty, mm. a pretty solid bet. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it could be Mephistoing here, but like it feels like it's a thing. <laughs> uh, uh, and so I'm just curious to see how they do it. Yeah. My, uh, Shannon, any thoughts on any final thoughts on this? I mean, I think it's an incredibly cool decision. Like, as we all know, that rumor has been out there for a very, yes. very long time that Namor was going to be the antagonist. And Namor is one of those characters that um, I, I don't know currently how, how the rights issues stand. But previously, Universal had the distribution rights. Yes. And that is why we didn't necessarily ever get like a Submariner movie. But I think when you were introducing such a larger than life concept and character into an established universe i think sh having him show up as an antagonist in another film is actually a really really smart decision mm -hmm. and i i mean namor is actually he, he precedes aquaman by a couple of years like he was actually yeah. the first 
water breathing character that water breathing superhero that came on the scene and for marvel comics creators you know namor has always been a bit of an anti-hero like he he <laughs> he isn't always like oh yeah the best dude he's a cocky uh, sob yeah yeah i mean i'm Namor. really curious go ahead oh no as i was gonna say dude's hot and he knows he's hot and he's happy to tell you he's hot that's who he yeah. is as a character yep. and he will hook up with sea creatures <laughs> um uh but sure. also, like, I'm really curious. That's true. That's in the books. <laughs> not like, not like the deep though. He'll do something else. Go ahead, yeah. <laughs> but also, I'm really curious how uh, because Wakanda is a landlocked nation. Like, I'm really mm. curious how they, unless that, unless that giant body of water uh, empties out oh. into the sea. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm really curious how this how this confrontation is going to take place. Um, but overall, I think do it's we... just I think it's just the coolest idea. Do we know that Wakanda is landlocked? Yes. Do we know where it yes. is in Africa? It is. Okay. It is. It, it is East Africa. It is west of Somalia, and I want to say north of Kenya. So it is okay. close to the water, but it is not on the water. Okay. 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 All right. Fair enough. Um, all right. Uh, so at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it's a uh, it's a uh, interesting casting if they go this route. Certainly, a lot of people felt they might go to a Pacific Islander or an Asian route, and uh, in the end. Uh, this might be the route they're going in terms of uh, going with Tenoch Huerta. And if it is, cool. Let's see what happens. Let's see what they create. Uh, just like we said in James Mangold, we trust. I think all of us in, in Ryan Coogler, we trust to see what he does here. Oh, yeah. And certainly. What a what a challenge for him uh, uh, due to tragic circumstances uh, to have to adjust this entire thing on the fly almost and see if he can make it work in this new phase that's coming and all that we've got going on there. So certainly – Shout out to them, and we'll see. We'll see what happens, and hopefully they don't bust this one down to an HBO Max series. All right. Anyway, that's it. Uh, that's the end of the show here for the Geek Buddies. Thank you all so much for watching this episode. We appreciate or listening to this episode on the podcast. If you haven't, head on over to the podcast feed. Please do so and subscribe. We got stuff going on there. Shannon, what do we have to tell them? Yeah, if you'd like to follow us on social media on Twitter, it's at geek underscore buddies on Instagram at the underscore geek underscore buddies. If you'd like to follow me on social media on Twitter, it's at Shannon underscore McClung on Instagram at Shannon the Geek Buddy. If you would like to follow Mr. Vogel, it is at MK2. And if you would like to follow Mr. Roca, it is at the Roca Says. Mikey? Uh, look, I don't care if you tweet in English, in Spanish, in <laughs> Japanese. You could tweet in whatever language you you want to as long as you're tweeting about the geek buddies that's what we have to say <laughs> uh and if you want to help us kind of continue to do what we do here a couple easy things you can do smash that like button below subscribe to johnny's outlaw nation page where there is tons of amazing content some with us some without us all with the outlaw uh it's in the name um leave some comments below let us know what you thought about this week's episode uh what do you think about this news about namor which trailers are you guys responding to are the looney tunes stale are the looney tunes great who do you agree with let us know what you think uh if you're listening to us on apple or spotify or anchor uh, definitely leave us some ratings and some comments there it always helps us out and as always the best thing that you guys can do is retweet this with a funny little quip uh send it to your friends post it on your facebook pages tell everybody to check out the Geek Buddies. There you go. All right, do all those things, ladies and gentlemen, please. Uh, we And keep coming back every week for what we do here. And of course, don't forget, we've got those reviews. We got Loki Episode 1 spoiler review out there, and we'll be having another spoiler review for the next episode of The Bad Batch coming up later on this week as well. So please pay attention to all the stuff we got coming on from the Geek Buddies. Thank you all so much. Take care of yourselves. Be well. Uh, and we'll talk to you next time on a, another brand new episode of The Geek Buddies! Buddies! <gasps>